There you are. <clears throat> so to start with, we will introduce the research data management regulations. And Sarita Grunewald and Samuel Simongo from the library will talk on that topic. And after that, we will talk about specific implementation aspects. Hilda Kreer from ICT will discuss some practical matters and tools that we have developed over time for implementation of the RDM. Gerald Toy from Information Governance will talk on this topic as well. And Samuel Simongo will then again share some of his experience and implementation technolo technologies and tools. We will also share from our office the, um, some DRD case studies, which we have picked up in the contractual in contracts, research contracts, <clears throat> specifically pertaining to research data management. And then after that, we look forward to hear from Professor Gerard Tromp and Professor Albert Streifer from the experience within the faculties. And we will end it off with a live Q and A session. We ask you to please um, start contributing your questions in the chat box, which we will also then try to answer once the presentations are done. I therefore now give over to Sarita Grunewald. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm just going to share my screen. I hope that's visible. Um, good morning, yes. like Cornelia. Thank you. <laughs> like Cornelia said, I'm Sarita Grunewald. I'm representing the Division for Research Development today. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide more information on the new research data management regulations that were approved by Senate in November 2020. Uh, these regulations are currently being implemented and the purpose of this presentation is just to create awareness and to draw your attention to the responsibilities of research and support divisions that are already available to researchers on campus. So Stellenbosch University acknowledges that our research data are valuable assets and contribute to the knowledge economy and therefore need to be managed, protected and curated in an appropriate manner. So in our um, data management regulations, we have the following definition for research data management. And it is the planning for the way in which the research data will be managed during and after the research process. That after is also a very important point. And then controlling the collection, processing, etc. of your research data. So research data management is a core principle of good scientific practice and scientific integrity. The question that we often get is why does Stellenbosch University need these regulations? Like Cornelia said, we need to uh, comply with specific national and international legislation and other requirements. And she already mentioned the COPIA and the GDPR. We also have ethical responsibilities, so we need to and protect our research participants and their privacy, and we must obtain informed consent where um, relevant and ensure scientific validity and integrity. Furthermore, we also have contractual requirements and we have external funder requirements, and that will can include IP or sharing or data retention. Uh, some research funders expect universities to have an institutional research data management policy or regulation in place. And they will require the submission of detailed due diligence questionnaires before they will consider the project. So that was also very important for these regulations to be um, in place for that. Then and institutional requirements are important. We are implementing the official organizational research data management strategy as part of the existing research governance framework. And we refer to other relevant uh, Stellenbosch University policies and regulations in these uh, RDM regulations. Um, and you can find a list of those uh, in the very last section of the regulation document. It's important to note that non-compliance um, can have severe financial repercussions and can cause reputational damage to the university. Apart from compliance, we also needed the regulation to provide um, and define principles of research data management governance and the protection of research participants. And we need to provide a framework to define the responsibilities of all Stellenbosch University members and um, the support services that we have. Uh, the regulation also guides researchers and students in the best practices of research data management, and you will learn a bit more about this later. So 
And as I said before, the regulations were approved by Senate in November 2020, and we've been implementing it. And it's part of the Stanabash University Research government, Governance Framework. Okay, when we come to the roles and responsibility, it's important to know that the model that describes and identifies the step that, you ta that has to be taken at the different stages of the research cycle to ensure successful data management is called the research data life cycle. And it basically um, consists of five phases. So firstly, data management and planning, then data collection, then processing and analysis, and then data sharing and dissemination and reuse. All of these um, aspects are discussed or described in the regulation with the requirements um, for research data at Stellenbosch University. During the um, data life cycle, we also do data curation, and that will include the maintaining, preserving, adding value to digital research data throughout the entire life cycle. So the roles and responsibilities of researchers and the research support division are included in section 15 of the research data management regulation and um, I will um, touch on that in my following diagram. The range of skills uh, and knowledge needed to deliver these RDM services is dictated by the individual phases of the research project life cycle. And um, in the first place, it is now very important to note that Stellenbosch University remains the legal entity and is, le is the legal owner of the research data and will also be accountable for ensuring that the maintenance of and access to research data and materials are in accordance with ethical, legal, institutional, etc. obligations. Um, but it will not be practical or reasonable from the perspective of the investigator for the institution to assume primary responsibility of the stewardship of the data. So the university assigns the principal investigator as the steward of the data, of all the materials and other research documentation that's part of the project. And so the principal investigation will, a principal investigator will be the data steward. Another important point here is that core ethical principles will apply to all forms of research and therefore the general requirements for research participant engagement social value, scientific validity, and integrity, including informed consent, the risk-benefit ratio, protection of privacy and confidentiality, are the same for all research. So if you hear the word ethics or ethical principles, and you are not working in a clinical a research environment, the ethical principles will also be relevant to your um, project as well. Um, and yeah, we also refer to the policy for responsible research conduct at Stellenbosch University, that is our policy, and um, both current and future users of the data should be considered. So if we look at the different stages of um, the research project, um, I divided that into project planning, that, that is the pre-proposal or just the planning phase of the project, um, and the principal investigator will be responsible for that. So here we will have a project plan, we will have uh, done our risk assessment, and we will, uh, will do our data management planning. And things that we have to consider here is good scientific practice, scientific integrity, as I just said. We will have national and international and institutional policies and regulations that we have to comply with. We've got our project management on the side here, and all of these activities will go into the project budget. And it's very important to note that your data management activities must also be part of your budget from the start in the preparation of the funding proposal or the project proposal. And the Division for Research Development has um, training, uh, workshops and sessions where they can help um, researchers with their um, proposal development and proposal writing. So then, um, the data management planning, we need to set up a data management plan for each and every research project at Stellenbosch University. The library and information services will help there, and um, they will help you um, sort out all the questions and all the issues that you have to add to the data management plan, including types of data, how the data will be stored, metadata standards, etc. When it comes to the contracting or the licensing of, of data and the IP strategy, Ownership and access, the Division for Research Development will assist research in that regard. The IT division can help um, researchers find out what type of ITT infrastructure they will need, 
and that includes hardware, software, online tools, uh, big data management, and costing. They have a way of um, helping, uh, they've got a calculator that they use that researchers can use to work out the cost that must go into the budget, as I just said. So if personal information will be collected, the Division for Information Governance can help researchers to do a privacy impact assessment, and um, IT can help researchers to plan how personal information will be de-identified or encrypted and securely stored. Then you have to apply for ethics approval if you are going to use human participants in your studies, in your project, and that's um, part of the um, research development um, division's activities there. So if you are successful in your funding proposal, then the funding agreement must be signed and DRD will help with that. And they are also involved in the due diligence questionnaires. If you are going to share your data, um, the DRD can also help you with the data transfer agreement. Uh, funded policy requirements must be taken into consideration here, and the DRD will also be there for researchers to help them. The, the head of department um, will be responsible for governance and oversight of research data management in the department. And then also, um, he's also, he or she is also responsible for the compliance with the RDM regulations in the department and can assist with departmental standards and other procedures that are discipline specific. So during the project, um, the principal investigator will be responsible for the execution of the work according to the project plan and then uh, data acquisition and management according to the data management plan. And this will basically just be the experiments, the observations, etc., that are done. Uh, active data and metadata storage will be very important here. And this is where um, IT can help researchers with the required software for active data storage and um, access control and safeguarding. The library and information services can help with metadata standards, file naming conventions, um, backups, reporting, um, at minimum information standards, etc. So um, researchers can um, go to the library information services. They also have training sessions and workshops for researchers. Then when the data is processed and analysed, it's also re the responsibility of the principal investigator. And um, in the end, you'll uh, sit with your process data <clears throat> and you need to prepare your data for, for um, research output. Uh, library information services again will be there to help with the visualization of your data and to prepare it for publication. After the project is finished or post project phase, um, the data can be published. The principal investigator will then again be responsible for the sharing and dissemination. And as I said before, if you need a data transfer agreement, you can talk to the Division for Research Development. Um, researchers must just make sure that they have an ORCID record because uh, that is not only relevant to um, academic or scholarly publications, but also data publications. There are different options when it comes to data publication. You can either deposit it in the uh, University Sun Scholar Data Repository that is also managed by the Library and Information Services. They have a lib guide and they provide assistance to researchers to deposit their data there. Then that you can also publish it as supplementary data to a published journal article or in a data journal, or you can deposit it in a third party digital data repository if that is a funder requirement. And all of these options can also be linked to the Sun Scholar Data Repository. So these are important um, things that researchers must decide on and the library and information services can guide and provide assistance there. And if your data is available for reuse, it will be secondary data um, for, that's available to other researchers for a different purpose, maybe, and the RDM cycle will begin again. And what is important here, if you are using secondary data for your own research project, it is important to ask the question whether you will need research ethics committee approval um, to work with that data, and um, DRD can help with that. And then usage, monitoring, and citation are other things that are very important here. Then digital curation, as I said, takes place um, through the entire data life cycle. And these are all the value-added activities and features to make the digital content meaningful and useful. And um, 
the library and information services can help researchers in that regard. So in all phases of the data life cycle, you will have support from support divisions on campus, and um, there is training available and um, lots of help. So apart from the uh, policies and regulations that form part of the research data management framework of the university, and that are included in the regulations, there are also several platforms and tools that are either already available to researchers or are in preparation. And the following um, presenters will tell you more about that. Thank you very much. Samuel, please. I'm just sharing my screen. Can you confirm if you can see that on your side? Yes, we can. OK. All right, my name is Sam Smuggle, the manager of resource data services based at the library. And my presentation will focus on the tools, resources, and training at Stellenbosch University. Um, starting off with the tools and platforms, um, here's a list of what um, is actually supported at the university, or at least approved. Um, first of all, we've got the online information about resource data management. This is information that is um, available on what are known as the RDM web pages hosted by the library. It provides information about um, what resource data management is, the rationale behind it, as well as data management planning and um, data sharing and dissemination in a bit of a condensed form. Um, what I should point out is that in terms of the inclusion of the data management planning software, um, even though that's included in the RDM regulations, there isn't an institutional solution that's available as of yet, but this will be discussed in a bit more detail. The idea is that we would actually, at the time being, we'll make use of um, what's known as data stewardship wizard and with the idea of eventually um, developing our own instance um, of data stewardship wizard at the institutional level. Now, in addition to the RDM web pages, um, the faculty and um, branch librarians at the library each have a libguide, and each of these libguides includes what's known as a research data support tab, which provides some distilled information about the research data services that are actually provided in terms of um, data management planning, consultations, as well as training services that are available. There's also um, a look guide on the research process, which includes some information about data analysis and data visualization. Um, in the future, there will also be a dedicated lip guide specifically for um, research um, data management as well with a much more detail than what I've just discussed right now. The next kind of tool that we have is actually the ethics management solution. Um, in Phonetica, which is managed by the um, university's research integrity office. So some of these things will not be entirely new because we've been um, adhering to ethics compliance for years now before the advent of um, research data management at, um, at the university. Um, in Phonetica is what is actually used by the researchers right now. And what I wanted to point out uh, which Sarita alluded to is that um, the RDM regulations did not necessarily change much of the content that you find in the ethics related policies or standard operating procedures. So most of things that have been in practice will continue. Um, what is interesting to note though is that um, the RDM regulations require that whenever someone actually applies for ethical clearance, they now need to submit a data management plan along with that application as well. The next tool then you have is known as the Privacy Impact Self-Assessment Tool. This is actually managed by the Division of um, Information Governance in order to facilitate uh, compliance with the uh, PAPAYA, the Protection of Personal Information Act. And essentially, the RDM regulations state that whenever someone is conducting research that involves human participants, they need to complete a Privacy Impact Self-Assessment. This is done so as to um, allow us to determine the risk profile associated with the risk data um, and that um, informs the decision with regards to the most appropriate medium of stories that should be used for the research data in question. The fourth tool that you see listed here is, relates to secure data collection. There are actually two tools in this category. REDCap is the first one. It's a secure data collection tool that's used primarily for questionnaires. can also be used for um, longitudinal studies, and um, it's primarily used in um, clinical studies. Um, this is a very secure tool that um, researchers can actually um, make use of. 
The other tool in question is known as Sun Surveys that's been around for a while. This is particularly useful when the data collected um, originate from staff members or students um, at the university, unlike um, with REDCap. Now, the next tool is the, um, relates to um, institutional storage solutions. Now, this was particularly important because the RDM regulations stipulate, or at least um, recommend that researchers should not actually make use of third party cloud storage options, particularly if their research data um, is sensitive in nature and researchers are actually advised to actually make use of um, institutional solutions provided by the IT division or at least by the library. Um, there could be exceptions, but that is generally that is the general rule and that facilitates compliance with the Papaya as well. IT's um, recommended tool in this case of choice is um, Microsoft OneDrive for business. It has to be the university's instance. Then there's also the issue of treatment of sensitive data. Now this part is actually important because the RDM regulations stipulate that sensitive data must be treated in a specific manner. So the IT div uh, division has recommended Microsoft Teams to be used, particularly when you actually have sensitive data. Going beyond that, there's an issue of secure data sharing because sometimes researchers do actually have to share their research data um, during the process of their research projects. A tool that is recommended for such purposes is known as um, file sender. Um, this is not necessarily managed by uh, the university, but it is approved by the IT division. It allows researchers to uh, share their data securely by sending um, up to 100 gigabytes of data to several individuals. The recipient receives a link and they can click it in order to download the data. Now, as Rita um, alluded to previously, when using tools of this nature and sharing data, it's important that a data transfer agreement be utilized and the division for um, research development can be contacted for advice um, in this respect. The next tool on the list is the institutional research data repository. Now, Sarita did mention that researchers can actually publish their research um, through various ways uh, as is permitted by the RDM regulations. What's um, important to note is that if researchers do not deposit their data with some scholar data, they should at least inform the library so that we can actually create links um, to wherever the research data have actually been deposited so that the data actually reflect on some scholar data, even if they're not deposited there. And if the data are not necessarily published, they should still at least be stored secure, securely um, using some kind of um, university infrastructure. This is what um, Sun Scholar data looks like. It's the institutional um, research data repository. At least that's what the interface looks like. And the data that are hosted on Sun Scholar data are curated and can be stored for a minimum of 10 years, after which the decision to um, continue storing the data would actually be um, reviewed. This is what the um, user account looks like. The next tool then would be um, online information specifically about um, Sun Scholar data. This is known as the Sun Scholar Data Lib Guide. We realized that researchers would actually probably need some kind of assistance or guidance regarding the use of the repository. So that's the purpose that the Sun Scholar Data Lib Guide actually serves. It provides detailed granular information, including how to guides, step-by-step um, -step guides on how the repository can actually be used. The next tool actually relates to um, an educational resource that was developed by Stellenbosch University and the University of Bath. It's known as the Resource Data Management Adventure Game. This is a serious game that actually allows researchers to learn more about um, research data management. It's very useful for early career researchers as well as postgraduate students. But anyone else with, who has an interest in research data management, such as research support staff or even seasoned researchers can make use of this tool. It guides research through the, researchers through the research data management life cycle and essentially presents them with various challenges um, that are embedded within a storyline. And based on the challenges and the performance of the researchers, they are either awarded points or they have points deducted. But the idea is that you get to learn about research data management in a safe environment without making mistakes in real life. The next tool, and I won't go into detail about it, is the Research ICT Service Desk. Um, I believe my colleague Kilda will go into more detail about this, but it suffices to point out that this is a collaborative space um, that facilitates the um, solicitation of advice from various stakeholders. So the library, the DRD, 
IT and Information Governance Division have their staff members working on this desk. And when queries come in the, um, through, via, uh, through the, um, the desk, the various individuals who participate on it can either provide advice through uh, researchers or solicit um, input from their colleagues on various matters relating to research data um, management issues. I just want to go quickly through the um, RDM related training services um, provided at the university. Um, the focus here will be on the training that has been provided by the library. The first one will be the introduction to RDM, um, which covers the research data management lifecycle and impacts it, and also covers some of these tools that I've actually just discussed right now. The second training session is on data sharing and dissemination. This unpacks the data sharing and dissemination stage of the RDM um, lifecycle. The, uh, the third training session focuses more on using Stellenbosch University's institutional research data repository in order to actually disseminate um, research data. So it's a practical session on how to use Sun Scholar data. Uh, the rest of these sessions um, are not necessarily managed by the Research Data Services Division, but they are certainly affiliated with Research Data Management. The first one is an overview of software for effective data analysis and data visualization. This is actually presented by my colleague uh, Marie Rue at the library, and it focuses on various statistical tools and data visualizations. And we have principles of data visualization. This is also um, presented by uh, Marie Rue at the library. And it um, provides a bit of an insight into the best visualization techniques that um, researchers can use. The next um, training session is an introduction to data visualization, specifically through the use of Tableau, the public version, as well as raw graphs. And finally, we have an overview of features of SAS for data analysis and uh, visualization. All of these training sessions that I discussed are actually part of the hashtag smart uh, researchers um, webinar series um, provided by the library. Now, in the interest of time, I won't go into detail um, with regards to the next tool. I'll discuss this a bit further um, in my second presentation. It's basically data stewardship wizard, simply because a lot of researchers generally raise questions about this tool whenever we actually deliver our presentations about the RDM regulations. It's a it's just to point out that the data stewardship wizard is a data management plan and software that the university is trying to implement right now. And we are probably going to launch this um, next year. And I will discuss more details about this um, in my next presentation. So at this point, I will just show you the contact details. If you want to find out more about research data management, that's who you can contact, or at least those are the links that you can use. And I'll bring this presentation to an end at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, we will go over now to the Hope you can see this to the implementation of the RDM regulations at Stanavosh University. First up will be Hilda Krier, and then Gerald Toy will follow on on that, and after that Samuel Simongo. I will not stop um, in between, so if the three of them can just continue after the other one's um, presentation, please. Thank you, Hilda. Thanks, Cornelia. Morning, colleagues. I'm going to share my screen with you. Yes, we can see. Thanks. Yes. Perfect. Um, so, colleagues, I'm going to talk to you about um, what we are doing to, if I may call it, operationalize research data management at the university. And as Sarita mentioned, the different stakeholders have different responsibilities with regard to research data management. And IT's responsibility is to ensure that the solutions are in place, the information and communications technologies to support good research data management. And what we are building is what we call the research ICT commons. You might know the concept from the natural commons which is a collection of resources, and in our case, it can be applications, services, infrastructure, 
um, that are available to all SU researchers, ideally at no charge. And this core ICT commons um, is intended to meet the requirements of the majority of researchers at the university. Um, so there will always be highly specialized requirements that cannot be met by the commons, and those we will address on a case-by-case -case basis. Then underpinning the commons is what we call the research ICT toolkit and Samuel referred to some of these tools and this is mapped onto the research life cycle just so that we have some systematic structured way of implementing the services and the tools that SU researchers need to do good research data management. Um, so as was mentioned, when researchers plan their research, a good starting place is the privacy impact self-assessment tool that the Division for Information Governance made available, because this will um, classify the sensitivity of the research data and the recommendations in terms of tools to use will be based on that classification. Um, it can be minimal risk, low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Um, what we also see now is that many funders uh, or research collaborators want to know what kinds of tools and security mechanisms are in place at the university to safeguard research data. So one of the services that's almost emerging is to complete those checklists that uh, funders or research co collaborators ask SU researchers to complete to, to clarify what the security mechanisms and security controls are that are in place. And we work closely with the DRD's legal experts, but focusing specifically on the ICT part of those contracts. Uh, then in terms of collecting data, Samuel mentioned REDCap. There are three institutional tools at the moment that facilitates data collection through the commons. It's REDCap, Sun Surveys, and MS Forms. You might ask why there are three. Uh, prior to REDCap, Sun Surveys was our primary data collection tool. But now with the Poppy Act coming into play, uh, as mentioned, the collaborators want to see stronger security mechanisms. So REDCap, for example, requires multi-factor authentication to access the solution. So not only a username and password, but also a one-time PIN. Um, so these additional security mechanisms mean that certain tools are more fit for purpose for data with a specific sensitivity rating. Then um, specific tools also in our toolkit to facilitate the safe storage of research data. Uh, those are mostly clustered around our Microsoft 365 stack. And the three ones that our researchers are most familiar with is OneDrive that we recommend to store data at the individual level. And then MS Teams for storing data sets when there's a lot of collaboration involved. So sharing your data with other SU researchers, but you can also invite not non-SU persons to access your specific team site. And it might be worth mentioning that there's quite a bit of storage space behind such a MS team site. I'm not gonna advertise too widely because as we know, the commons is a finite resource, um, but we're looking at 10 terabytes and up for a team site. Then SharePoint underpinning every team site with much more sophisticated content management functionality. So if you are looking at approval workflow, for example, then your 
dig deep below teams into a SharePoint site. And um, then another tool in our toolkit that more of our researchers are starting to use um, is the Power Platform, including Power Apps. And the interesting development we're seeing there is the emergence of so-called low-code and no-code developers. So researchers building their own application using the Power Platform. Um, and what we are implementing, testing at IT at the moment is a research software engagement service so that uh, researchers who want to use these low code and no code tools can power can power sorry can um, can partner with our our IT developers um, for advice and guidance. Uh, then in terms of analyzing data, many of you will know that via the university software hub, you have access to some institutional software packages, such as Atlas TI, for example, and MATLAB. Also, our high performance computing team within IT uh, can assist our researchers who want to use compute functionality, and then they can also assist those researchers who wants to make use of the CHPC's uh, resources to, to prepare their data to make use of, of that service. Then in terms of sharing and moving data, Samuel referred to file sender. There's also send it, which is embedded into the REDCap application. And then if none of those more out of the box solutions work for you, we can consider um, secure FTP as well. Just in terms of sharing data with um, persons, sharing data to the public domain, uh, one of the platforms that's maybe not that well known is Umeka, which is an application to create online digital archives or online digital libraries. So it has the functionality to, to accommodate rich media such as videos and audio files, for example. And then also, as Samuel mentioned, um, archiving data after the conclusion of the active research project um, into Sun Scholar data. And then I thought I'd just mention as well, some of the services that IT offers that our researchers might not be that familiar with. So we also assist research groups to articulate their requirements into requirement specifications. Um, and if their requirements are well documented, our research groups find that it's then easier to apply for funding because the funders can see very clearly what a specific solution is envisaged to do. So the business analysts within IT can assist research groups to um, articulate requirement specifications. Then also what we do is research groups who want to acquire bespoke solutions. We work with those research groups. If the plan is, for example, to store the, the application on ICT infrastructure to make sure that the application will fit into what we call our ICT ecology. So to make sure if certain ports have to be open that that can happen, or if certain parts has to be open through the institutional firewall, for example, if this is viable and how it can be done. Um, so we are encouraging our research groups where possible to speak to IT before they, they buy their own service that will sometimes stand underneath the desk in an office, but rather to investigate how to 
um, work with the central infrastructure, such as virtual machines, for example, where our dedicated IT sysadmins um, can, can assist to, to host those applications. Then for those research groups who buy bespoke applications, but because of the security requirements, they are interested in using the university's authentication mechanisms, login mechanisms. We can also work with the vendors that provide those applications to see how we can implement authentication mechanisms so SU persons can use their SU username and password even to log into to cloud applications. So these are just some of the behind the scenes work that, that the IT specialists can assist with as well. Um, then, as Samuel mentioned, we implemented the Research ICT Service Desk in collaboration with all of the research support divisions. And this is your one-stop shop starting um, place if you want to ask questions about the how and where of research data management. The next step in terms of the research ICT service desk is to create a knowledge base that will underpin the service desk, so guidance articles. So if you go to the service desk, there will be a link, for example, to OneDrive guidance, and you can find the answers yourself, and only if there is something that the guidance document does not answer, you can log a request on the service desk and we will help with the more advanced application support. So we we got the, the knowledge base was activated last week, so we're very keen to start populating it now. And this is all from my side. Uh, there's a question and answer session at the end and I'll be happy to, to take your questions there. Thank you, colleagues. Jerome. Thanks, Cornelia. Thanks, Hilda. I am quickly going to share my screen too. Just give me a moment to find it. There we go. All right, so I'm I'm Jarrell. I am one of our institution's two deputy information officers under the Protection of Personal Information Act and the Promotion to Access to Information Act 2. But I'm just going to focus on privacy today. I've got a short series of slides. I'm not going to focus on the things you've probably heard about privacy. When the Act came into play, for example, the individual elements of the Act, I'm rather going to try and focus on uh, what's the real risk behind privacy, uh, explain our institutional stance on privacy on one slide, and give a few pointers uh, towards some basics and some resources that we have in our institution. So the real risk with privacy is not uh, simply not complying with POPIA or any other privacy legislation like the General Data Protection Regulation. Rather, if there is a, a real event like a data breach, for example, then there is a host of other impacts on not only the institution, but on the, if in the case of a research project, the research project itself too. And those impacts could range from the operational to financial and reputational. Now, IBM Security conducts an annual cost of a data breach study internationally. And for 2021, they discovered that it takes uh, on average 212 days to identify that a breach has even happened. And it takes a further 75 days to contain the breach. So if something was breached on New Year's Day, we might have solved it by October on average. 
And then the average cost of a breach is 4.24 million USD. And with the South African average at 3.21 million USD. Now that cost is calculated on a variety of different points and activities. So for example, it's the cost involved in detecting and escalating a breach. It's the cost involved of notifying the affected individuals, uh, notifying relevant government organizations. It's the lost business because of the breach and it's the cost of recovering and returning to a, a let's call it a post breach business as usual. And the education sector is not immune from this. Uh, Hilda in her session mentioned something about uh, buying our own servers as, as academic departments or researchers or even uh, administrative or support functions doing this buying our own servers and putting them under a desk. One of the more, more infamous breaches in the education sector globally is about that exactly. Uh, about two, maybe three years ago, Greenwich University was fined by the the UK Information Commissioner's Office uh, for 120,000 Great British Pounds for a, a historical breach, which was traced, which was basically caused by a, a server that was set up in 2004 for a for a microsite for a, a conference and that that microsite and that server was simply just left alone since then uh, it wasn't taken down etc and the actual breach happened nearly a decade after that that old server just lying around which uh, the university central it didn't he probably didn't even know existed so these are there are real implications for for not complying with privacy legislation, but it's not. But we don't comply with the legislation just so we comply. Um, for example, privacy legislation would say we need to make sure we have a good backup strategy for our information. But we have good backup strategies for the peace of mind that it brings us. It, it's, it, it's nice to be able to sleep at night knowing that should I spill coffee on my laptop, my research can still continue because I've put it on OneDrive already. I have that backup there. Now, in this IBM study, what was interesting this year is that 20% of the breaches considered were attributed to stolen or compromised credentials. And we can actually check if our own credentials have ever been compromised. And we can do this right now. So in another tab or in another window or on another device, if you're already doom scrolling on your phone while this is going on, uh, you can open uh, Have I Been Pwned? This is a service that is uh, was started by an Australian security researcher. What he does is he collects uh, leaked data sets and indexes them. And if those leaked data sets have a phone number or an email address, you can search for an email address or phone number. And if through your search that email address is flagged as being breached in, let's say, a LinkedIn or Dropbox or Canva or Etiquini municipality, the service will report back on that and say, All right, this email address has been compromised here. These are the different fields that were compromised in this breach. This is what it means to have those fields compromised, and this is what you can do to, to take action to mitigate the impact of this compromise. So while we're having a chat, maybe when we get to the Q&A session, a few of you that are brave enough might be willing to share some of the sites where you've been caught out. And this, I find, just makes the, the whole concept of privacy and security just more real, knowing for sure uh, that I have been breached and what I can do and how I can maybe change my behavior from a personal security point and take those lessons and apply it to my research data as well. Now, very quickly, our Stellenbosch University privacy stance on one slide. Uh, Popea itself 
has eight principles and a few years ago when we launched our first version of our privacy regulation we decided to add two more and so our current version has 10 principles but what we're trying to do now really into 2022 is to refine our our privacy regulation and make it more easily understood and we can aiming to drop it down to six principles for us so hopefully in the next quarter or two these six uh, points on this slide will form our, our new privacy regulation. That's what we're aiming for. But for now, briefly, firstly, we need to recognize that all information has value. We need to understand how valuable information is and then respond appropriately to the value of that information. As Samuel mentioned in his, his section, we have a privacy impact self-assessment. That's a quick tool that lets us understand the value of any personal information we're working with from the following viewpoints. One, from a legislative perspective, our legislation identifies certain types of information as more valuable or more sensitive. An example would be the information of children, uh, health information as well. But then we also look at, in the impact self-assessment, we also look at the uh, let's call it the the malicious user's ability to exploit certain types of information. Now, our legislation doesn't call out financial information as particularly sensitive, but we know that certain financial information can be used to to for a host of different information related crimes such as fraud. So in our self-assessment, we also build in those checks as well. And then finally, there are certain other standards. So for example, the payment card industry has their own standard on security. And within those standards, they also classify certain, let's say, information types that are more sensitive than others. So we build as many of these as we can into our self-assessment tool should take you five minutes to fill it in to give you a baseline view of how valuable your information is with a few pointers to either ways to reduce the value so for example reconsider what personal information you need versus um, different or higher security controls you can consider to implement to match the value of the information you're working with number two Papier isn't just consent driven. There are a host of other options and justifications that may apply for the lawful processing of personal information. And I'll get to those in more detail in one of my next slides. Number three, we should only process what we absolutely need to process to meet our goal. Because the more and more information we collect, the greater our, our risk or the value of the information increases. As, you collect more and more different types. So if you can narrow things down to that which you only absolutely need, things may become a bit easier for you as well. Number four, we need to take steps to ensure we protect the confidentiality and the quality and availability of our information. Um, this links directly to information security. Confidentiality is about protecting against unauthorized access. Quality or integrity is protecting data or information against unwanted edits. And availability is about being able to access your information when you want to access, so your backup strategy. We need to be transparent about what we're doing with personal information. This ties in nicely with the research ethics uh, considerations on informed consent. And then finally, we need to know what to do in case of an information breach, which is I'll discuss more on another slide. Very quickly, some basic privacy basics. Number one, it is a, a human right. If a country doesn't have it as a specific piece of legislation, it is almost always at least in their constitution or under their Bill of Rights. For South Africa, we all have a right to privacy, which includes the right to not have our persons or homes searched, our properties 
searched, our possessions seized, or our communications infringed. Our legislation also further uh, clarifies or defines a, a series of different roles that may be in play. Uh, number one, we have a responsible party, that is the individual or the organization that determines the purpose of and means for processing personal information. We could also have an operator, a, an individual or an organization that processes information on behalf of a responsible party. And being clear on those two roles are very important, especially when it comes to contracts, especially research contracts. So who actually owns the information? Who's ultimately responsible for it? What are the duties of the operator? So in some research projects, the university or the research team, they are an operator. In other projects, they are a responsible party. And knowing the difference is key, especially in the contract space. And then, of course, we have the data subject who is the person to whom the information relates. And then as I mentioned earlier, the peer is more than consent driven. Uh, it allows for a host of different uh, justifications for the lawful processing of personal information. I like to ask myself questions to figure out which one may apply for any particular project. So we may process personal information as part of a contract. So for example, our HR department at the university processes our banking information to pay our salaries based on our employment agreement. HR doesn't necessarily come to us every month and asks for our consent uh, to be paid. There might be an obligation imposed by law. So an easy one in our space is reporting to government departments. A legitimate interest is a, an interesting one. At, there's a lot of nuance there. Um, if you find yourself in this space, I, I'd recommend you reach out to at least your, your to the DRD and potentially to our division in information governance to help you out with this one. Uh, a legitimate interest is, it's probably best explained with an example. So as a university, we have a legitimate interest to secure the physical access to our buildings, but there are many different ways in which we can do this. Uh, probably a more extreme ways we can have biometric systems. And even within that, with even, even with that space, there are more extreme measures too. Uh, facial recognition is very different from a, a thumbprint, but all of those require a different level of processing personal information. Now, the interesting thing about legitimate interest is, yes, we can use it as our justification, but we must always provide the data subject the ability to opt out or object to that legitimate interest or, or to that reason or to the method we're using. Uh, so back to the physical access example, the we wouldn't want to have every single one of our of our visitors to campus giving us their thumbprints and facial. It's just too much for us to manage as a universe. Too much risk. So we provide another mechanism for them to use, and that might be as simple as presenting yourself to building security. Uh, with a with ID, and that may be sufficient. All right, then to move on to the other justifications, there might be a duty under law, or if none of the none of those apply, then we can consider consent. And we have a host of privacy resources available. Uh, we have our own dedicated websites for this, sun.ac.za slash privacy. There you can find our privacy regulation. That's also where you can conduct our impact self-assessments. And we have a host of guidance notes from our university itself, but also from the sector as a whole. And of course, you can request facilitated training or a full impact assessment. So if your self-assessment comes back as high, you have no mechanisms to reduce the value or the risk of the information, then it is prudent to do a full impact assessment to, to truly understand and unpack the risk and make sure that the controls you design 
to address that risk are appropriate. And finally, you can use that same link to report a potential information breach. And that was a very brief introduction to Papia. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Okay, thank you, Cornelia. Just going to share my screen once again. Um, can you confirm if you see that? Not yet, but there, there it is. All right. Um, this second presentation of mine is actually going to be about um, research data management, at least Stella and Bosch's university's journey. And the focus in this regard is on um, the library's involvement with research data management over the past few years. Um, start off with the past. Um, let me just click that. Um, so this was before at least 2016. At that particular moment in time, the library undertook a literature survey just to find out a bit more about um, research data management. This involved a lot of reading, as you can see by the books depicted there. And it culminated in the inclusion of um, research data management um, within the library's strategic um, objectives, or at least under two of the library's um, strategic um, objectives that you can see there um, in bold. Now, moving on to 2016 is when things um, really started happening. In 2016, there was a survey known as the ICT4 um, research survey that was actually conducted at the university. It covers several areas, um, about 10 or 11, and one of them was actually research um, data management. But there were other um, affiliated areas, such as um, research data storage, by way of example. And so far as research data management is concerned, what the survey indicated was that there were some core problems with regards to the manner in which researchers treated their um, research data at the university. The data were not findable and were hard to access. So there are several problems that were identified, and in terms of one of the identified solutions, an appropriate medium of storage that would make the data findable accessible was actually proposed, and that would be something like um, Sun Scholar data. Now, as it happened in 2016 as well, there was a consortium known as the Elifu Consortium, which actually consists of um, the four um, higher education institutions in this province as well as the Square Kilometer Ray Project and Seoul Pike University. Now, these um, institutions got together and primarily the four higher education institutions in the, um, in the province decided to actually um, form this consortium. And amongst um, the working groups that were created within the consortium, one of them actually related to open science under which you would find research data management. This actually paved the way for funding um, that would actually fund the um, the Institutional Research Data Repository at Upsilon Bosch University that later on came to be known as Sun Scholar Data. In 2017, the consortium proceeded um, to actually gather steam and a lot of things were actually done. Um, in terms of the projects that the various um, working groups had to do, um, the four universities set up um, certain um, online resources related to research data management. Um, the repositories were piloted at the various universities, and there was also some work related to data management planning, as well as setting up governance documentation relating to research data management. And we started in that year with what was known as the, um, I think the RDM, what do you call it, pilot project, which I'll cover in the next, um, what do you call it, slide um, in 2018. But another key thing, uh, key development in 2017 was that the manager for research data services post was actually uh, created. So in this case, the, the library was really becoming serious about addressing research data services. And I was appointed to this position um, in that year in order to drive research data management um, in initiatives, or at least rather research data services. So in 2018, the library then created the RDM web pages that I discussed earlier on in my first um, presentation to provide researchers with some information about um, research data uh, management, just um, for, for researchers to actually be informed whilst we continue to actually develop more um, research data management services. During that very same year, we actually um, really then proceeded with our pilot project. In the previous year, what we've done is we had assessed the software, but we really went um, into a bit more detail in terms of piloting the software, seeing how it actually worked so that we can actually move to implement um, 
Figshare's um, repository at the university. So Figshare is the software that powers Sun Scholar data, and this is what the interface looked like during the pilot phase. By 2019, you'd see that um, there are more things coming um, online, so to speak. Um, the repository was actually then implemented um, between 2018 and 19. We developed certain guidelines for the repository, such as the Sun Scholar data regulations, the Sun Scholar data terms and conditions of use. Um, these documents were drafted in collaboration with the DRD, as well as the implementation team for the repository. And we developed associated services, such as um, training sessions. Um, I'll cover these later later on when I get to um, year 2021, but the earliest of these were actually developed in 2018, I'm sorry, 2019. We also trained our relevant um, library staff so that they could actually provide support um, in regard to research um, data services. And eventually the repository was actually launched later on um, during that year. The library um, also conducted a bit of a survey. So this was a questionnaire just to find out um, the awareness that researchers had about research data management, about data management planning, as well as um, the degree of interest that there was surrounding the use of an institutional research uh, data repository. Um, this definitely informed some of the decisions that we made with regards to how we would actually steer our research data services. In 2019, um, a team of um, library staff members visited um, the United States and visited these four universities that you actually see there in order to find out how they actually um, manage their research data or rather how their libraries went about um, implementing research data services. Some of these um, universities had more mature um, offerings than we do. In fact, most of them most certainly, but there are different stages. And we wanted to see what kind of best practices we could sort of like take from them and apply them at Stellenbosch University as we actually wrote out our own research data services. Having returned from the US, we then had um, a strategy workshop on research data services. This was an internal session um, at the library, and we wanted this to be aligned with the university's strategic framework 2019 to 2024. And it culminated in the um, formulation of a strategy report um, with regards to how the library would actually support research data services, which staff members would play certain roles and how they would actually support the division. There was a team known as the research data services team that was then created internally and it had sub teams that would then allow research data services to actually be provided at least at the faculty level and this was done to sort of support the, um, the manager of research data services that being me in, in this particular case so this was at least fleshed out back in um, 2019 just before we eventually launched um, Sun Scholar data the focus at that time was on how we would actually provide support for the repository and then grow our service offerings um, over time. The repository was eventually launched in 2019, in August of 2019. My memory serves me correctly, it was on the 12th of August. And this is what the interface looked like by the time that we launched it. In addition to launching the repository, then we also created a, the Sun Scholar Data LibGuide because I realized that um, you can have the repository um, on its own, but researchers still need some kind of information regarding how they can actually use this actual um, technology. So that's why we actually created the Sun Scholar Data LibGuide in 2019 as well. And you would have already seen this in my um, first presentation. Moving on to 2020 then, um, the library participated in the drafting of the RDM regulations. Um, this actually started way back in 2019, but the regulations were eventually um, finalized in 2020. And um, in November of that year, um, the University Senate actually approved the documents and the commencement date of the regulations was actually the beginning of this year. And as we sort of alluded to, the RDM regulations essentially govern the management of research data at Stellenbosch University. Later on last year, what we did on Sun Scholar Data is that in addition to allow researchers um, to um, deposit their own data, we 
also started linking research data sets that have already been published by avenues such as supplementary data sets that have been published with journals. So most notably, what you see here would be the PLOS journals. And this is a series of various journals that um, allow us to actually link um, to their data sets because they also run on Figshare's um, software. So we were at least able to get thousands of research data sets dating as far back as 2006 up until 2020. So from there on, we decided that we'll do an annual ingestion of PLOS um, journal data sets. And the last ingestion was actually performed in August of this year. And this will be done yearly. And over time, we'll try to broaden the scope so that um, it applies to other journals other than the PLOS journals, and so that we can also um, harvest um, data sets from um, third party research data repositories that exist out there, just so that we can point to research data uh, sets that exist elsewhere. Now, the last thing from 2020 that is noteworthy would be the RDM training sessions. As I indicated previously, these were actually launched as far back as um, 2018. The introduction to RDM training session was actually launched in 2018, and over time we added on new training sessions. So by 2020, we had three um, RDM core training sessions, and the view is to actually launch some more training sessions, such as one on data management planning next year. And what happened last year that you won't see on this slide is that um, data visualization and data analysis um, Training sessions were also added to the hashtag smart researcher um, series of training sessions, which have now become webinars um, owing to the pandemic. But I didn't include those in this presentation simply because they were covered in my previous presentation. But that actually um, was a representation of the library's offerings of training sessions related to research data management as of 2020. Moving on now to the present, at least in 2021, what you see is that the RDM adventure game was eventually launched. <clears throat> Stellenbosch University launched the game in March of this year, whereas um, the University of Bath um, took the decision to launch the game last year in December. Um, as of today, I believe the game has been played by over 1,200 um, individuals across 63 countries because it's not just an institutional um, game. And then um, earlier on this year, I believe in March as well, the Research ICT Service Desk was actually launched and the library participated in this as well. This has led to an increase in traffic in terms of queries uh, related to research data management, particularly with regards to data management uh, planning. And it's really showed us that um, there is a core need for research data services um, at the university. So this desk has been really, really useful in that regard. The next thing that happened this year was that we conducted a core trust seal repository audit. This was basically an audit of the um, Sun Scholar data repository. The audit itself actually commenced last year and the view is to see if we can actually get the repository certified as a trustworthy um, repository. This is basically a badge of quality and um, it's not necessarily finalized yet. We just submitted the application um, in September of this year, but it took several months just to get that um, prepared and finalized. Now, the next thing that I want to cover actually relates to the Institutional Research Data Management Plan and Software. As I indicated in my previous presentation, there wasn't time to actually go into the details, but fortunately I did have a contingency plan and I included some of these slides in this presentation. What I wanted to mention about this tool is that um, we're in the process of actually implementing our own data management planning um, solution. So the implementation project itself has not necessarily commenced. We have had a look at several tools. There are several that do exist out there. And the most promising one was actually Data Stewardship Wizard. This is a look of um, what you see here is actually the development um, instance that we have at Stellenbosch University. We're just basically trying to see how the tool actually works before we move the project through to IT so that 
we can go for with the actual implementation. The way that it works is that it has a smart questionnaire that allows researchers to complete a template. So if your research funders does not necessarily have a template, you can then make use of an institutional template. At the time being, we refer people to Data Stewardship Wizards third party um, free tool that can be used. Um, and it's a very good tool. It's just that um, it's not a customized template. And that's what we believe would actually provide the best value to the university's researchers. Um, so if I go forward, what I want to point out is that after researchers have actually completed the um, SMART questionnaire, it generates a data management plan, which looks something like this. So even though what you ask will be um, multiple choice questions or options that allow you to select one option or one or two options, it, the tool generates a bit of a narrative on a researcher's behalf that looks something like this. And it adheres to what are known as the core um, the core requirements for data management plans. In addition to that, in the background, the tool also generates a set of metrics, which can also be accessed by the researcher to see the degree to which um, the responses comply with certain um, requirements. These are known as the FAIR data principles, and they cover each stage of the research data management lifecycle that um, Sarita spoke about earlier. So the tool provides metrics at the greater at the general level, but it also breaks it down um, according to each phase of the um, data management lifecycle. I've only included the creation and collecting stage here, but it actually does cover the entire research data management lifecycle. Now, the key thing that I really wanted to bring to people's attention that is really important about this tool is that it's much more than a tool that um, allows one to comply with um, funder requirements. The tool itself can actually be integrated with other software systems, so it can essentially communicate with them. And in addition to generating human readable data management plans, it can also generate machine actionable um, data management plans that can actually then at least communicate with other systems. So if you look at the tools that I discussed during my first presentation, to a large degree, a data management planning software system such as this one can act as um, an umbrella or at least a, a glue that um, brings them all together in one platform. So by customizing this tool um, to our own desires, we can have a solution that allows us to change some of the questions. I've had a look at some of the questions that we might want to tweak them a bit. We can have questions that um, apply specifically to our legislative environment, um, such as questions related to papaya or South African intellectual property laws. And you can also have referrals to specific staff members at the university. You can have links to specific tools that are, spe that are supported or recommended by the university. Um, you can also have integration with certain tools. So for instance, you can integrate a system like this with um, your research information management system or with your institution research data repository so that at the end of um, at the end of the research data life cycle you can actually see everything that's supposed to come in through the pipeline you can also integrate things such as ontologies for researchers so instead of having researchers always look for information you can have the solutions sort of like built in or at least integrated to a certain degree so i don't want to over promise too much but at least these are the things that we're trying to get in place in terms of the actual um, implementation. And this is why we're trying to get an institutional version of Data Storage Wizard, as opposed to just using the third party version of the tool. And that's pretty much where we're at. If there was anything else I would have added there, it would have been the research in Davao today, in terms of which we would actually inform researchers about what's happened at the university over the past few years. Um, thank you very much, Cornelia. I'm done with this presentation. Thank you again um, for a very informative presentation. So, um, sorry, I would just like to say next on um, it will first be Olaf Esterizen and then Nasima Sonde. They are both legal advisors on research contracts and they will share some of the experiences of what they have came across this past couple of months. And then after that, we will listen to Professor Gara Tromp and Professor Albert Strever who will share some of the insights and challenges and lessons learned in their own environments. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm just quickly sharing my screen as well. Okay. 
I can see it. Just put it. Yes, it's perfect. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, uh, I hope the discussions thus far have been, have been useful. Um, it's provided us with a good concept of, of what the research data management regulations that have recently been implemented um, pertain to and how they attempt to regulate our researchers' actions in processing data. So what we'll be looking at from the research contracts office perspective is, is what exactly constitutes contracts for purposes of engagement with not only the participants who we obtain the data from in the course of our studies, but also how the exchange of that data that was collected um, is regulated by agreements that are entered into with third parties outside of the university. So when we look at the definition of a contract, I came across a, a definition that was incorporated in a 1925 publication um, and Wikipedia came across this and it says plainly that it is a contract is a legally binding agreement that defines and governs the rights and duties between or amongst its parties. So this presupposes that there's some type of agreement that is reached between a number of participants and to a contract. Um, it doesn't necessarily specify that this contract needs to be in writing or oral. And, and there's good reason for that. So a common misperception of when a contract is initiated or concluded <clears throat> um, in the course of research data management is, is the following. Um, the, the first such contract associated with management of data is the one initiated once the matter is referred to a legal advisor to record the contractual ter terms for the exchange of data for research collaborations with third parties. This is most often not the case, and this is illustrated by way of unpacking the life cycle um, for your data management plan. So contractual processes become prevalent even before a member of SU conceives and conceptualizes a research project. Who are these members of, of SU? The research data management regulations define these members as staff members, research students, postdoctoral fellows, external workers, and even research collaborators who carry out research under the university's auspice. So, which contracts are prevalent then, taking into account the definition of the contract in respect of research data management? In other words, how many contracts fit the Wikipedia definition of a contract when you look at the data management process and its life cycle. I've distinguished bef between three types of contracts that, that are most prevalent during the life cycle of your data management plan or process. The first of these are arguably employment agreements, student registrations and postdoctoral affiliations, etc. Um, so, the question will be posed, how does an employment agreement or a student registration or postdoctoral affiliations have anything to do with, with research data management? This, this is the first point or port of call for purposes of how data will be managed by us as an institution. So these envisage contracts which are entered into between SU and an individual by means of which the individual becomes a member of SU and then in turn agrees to comply with Stellenbosch University's policies and regulations. And particularly in relation to this discussion, then you agree as either employee or a student or a postdoctoral affiliate to comply with the policies and regulations governing research data management. So in other words, the rights and duties that are defined in this first contract type are the rights of, and duties of SU and the members of SU amongst themselves. Secondly, the second contract type that I've identified is, um, and this goes back to the definition 
as contained in the research data management regulations um, for consent. Um, and consent constitutes any voluntary, specific and informed expression of will in terms of which permission is given by a research participant or a data subject for the processing of personal information by a member of Stellenbosch University in this instance. So this entails a contract between a member of SU, like we've described them on the previous slide, and a particular research participant or data subject, which is in the normal course drafted by the member of SU for inclusion in the proposals for research, <clears throat> which are to be submitted um, uh, more often than not to the research ethics committees for review. So these consents that form the second contract type define the rights and duties between the Stellenbosch University and the particular research participant or data subject. The third type of contract, keeping in mind the definitions of contracts, um, are those that appear from arrangements between SU and, Stellen and, and, and third parties, and as far as concerns research, specific research projects. So this presupposes that you have drafted your proposal and it's run its course through the normal research ethics committees. And now you're in a position where you have gathered information or data from, from individuals. And you want to regulate the use of that data by other parties. So there are a few prevalent agreements that come to mind. And you'll see there are quite a vast array and they include most of the agreements that we draft at the Research Contracts Office. Um, there are research agreements or grants and funding agreements and tenders, all of which may contain certain terms and conditions that regulate the processing of data, the collaboration agreements, and as far as you want to exchange some of this data with collaborators at other research institutions, service level agreements, and as far as you might want to house your data that has been collected with a specific service provider for purposes of your research project. And then the, there are the more um, prevalent material and data transfer agreements where we deal specifically with the transfer of data amongst institutions for purposes of research. Oddly enough, there are often instances where you don't necessarily enter into a formal agreement by way of the research contracts office, but you come across a, a domain containing data, and that domain is more often than not regulated by terms and conditions of use. So this third contract type then envisages um, agreements that are entered into between Stellenbosch University and third parties with whom you want to share data or receive data from. So I've identified a few golden rules in relation to how you identify how many contracts you anticipate having to enter into during the life cycle of your research data management process. So in how many instances does the definition of contract come into play when you intend to process data? Second rule here, who are the parties to each of these contracts? Third rule is, what are the rights and duties of those parties you've identified in terms of the contract? And fourth, is there a legislation that governs the contracting and the terms and conditions that will apply with reference to a specific individual, um, where they have citizenship or geographical legislative requirements that need to be taken into account. Then we come to the case study. Now that we've defined the, the life cycle and we've identified um, all the manners and tools in which we um, utilize for purposes of identifying the nature of the data, 
Um, you come across a case study where, uh, for example, the Ultra Trial Cape Town UTCT hosts a trail marathon and they record the results and the placements of runners at the end of each race. Um, you can note that there might be local participants and also global participants that partake in this marathon. The event is hosted by Summit Events, which is a South African-based entity, and Summit Events in turn post the results of the race on a public domain website. One of the other factors to take into account for purposes of the case study is then some of the runners competing in the event also make use of Strava. Well, Strava is a subscription-based social media application for runners. Um, and by way of your subscription, you have access to an app that records your personal information relating to training patterns, distances, your geographic location in some instances, how quickly you finish your five kilometer run, for example, and it even takes your heart rate rate to the extent that you've got one of these smartwatches. So this data is then in turn shared with the other subscribers to the Strava app. So the intention of the researcher in, in relation to this case study would then be to cross-reference, analyze, and draw certain scientific conclusions between the information appearing from the UTCT race results and how they marry with all the training that the um, Strava user has put in place before he actually competed in the UTCT trial run. So the question then again appears, how many contracts are there in this specific case study? The, for, the first contract type would invariably always be relevant. Um, as there will always be a SU member who has the intention of um, gathering data by, through, through, through the auspices of the university. So that is governed by SU's policies and regulations for research data management. That's typically the contract between you and the, the university as a researcher that you will comply with the Stellenbosch University policies and regulations in as far as they pertain to research data management. And these policies and regulations have been drafted in line with, with legislation and best ethical practices. Arguably, the second type of contract could also be relevant to the case study in as far as you are a researcher at the Stellenbosch University who chooses to enter into a contract with each of the competitors of UTCT um, who competed in the marathon um, by way of an informed consent. This might not always be practical um, to the extent that you will have to have the manpower to actually extract all the information uh, on the ground, literally, um, after the race has been completed. So, which brings us to the third type of contract where the personal information or data has already been collected in these instances by um, UTCT or Summit Events. Um, and or Strava by way of their app. Um, these contracts we need to keep in mind will however be governed by mutually agreed terms and conditions um, against the backdrop of legislative prescripts attaching to the geographical area on the one instant, in the, on the one hand, and the data that's being processed um, of the specific individual on the other. So the third contract type also becomes relevant to the extent that once you've collected the data, you intend to utilize the data not only for your institutional purposes, but also um, to share it with collaborators of third party institutions 
who might be assisting you in relation to certain aspects of your research project. Where the data is shared with service providers um, who manage big data sets, sets to be accessed um, by other researchers or consortia. And it's also prevalent where data is curated through service providers appointed for the purposes of such curation at the end of your data life cycle. So just shortly in conclusion, there are various contracts entered into during the research data life cycle, and our researchers should be cognizant of which support services to engage to ensure compliance. Um, first contract types, where ASU members contract with ASU, um, involve the owners of the particular policy or the gatekeepers who wrote the policy. Second contract types, where consent regulates the rights and duties between SU and the research participants or data subjects, more often than not involve research ethics committees. And third party contracts, which requires the terms and conditions for transfer of processing of data between SU and third party institutions, is more often than not assisted by way of our office at research contracts to articulate, articulate and then record the rights and duties of each of the parties um, in, in, in terms of the engagement with that data. For some further case studies, I'll now hand over to my colleague Nassim. Thank um, good morning, everyone. Um, Olaf, I think, are you going to stop sharing or can I override that? Is it down? Yes. Okay. I think you should be able to see my full screen now. Yes, I can. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Nesima Sande, and I'm also a legal advisor at DRD. Um, where my colleague Olaf uh, touched on some of the pre-contractual considerations, or rather the phase one contracts, I will be discussing um, relevant considerations to the third contract types that, um, that he mentioned. So as um, Sarita also mentioned previously, DRD will assist with data transfer agreements and other relevant contracts, as well as uh, funder policy requirements. And I will touch on these aspects um, in my presentation. Um, so put to, so to put the specific requirements I'll be discussing into context, um, these are the, um, well, these are one of the regulations that I will be discussing. Um, this is Regulation 8 on data sharing. So when you as a researcher are acquiring or sending research data, you will require a data transfer agreement to ensure that all the appropriate legislative and regulatory considerations um, have been catered for. So we um, assist regularly um, and more often, uh, more so more often right now with, with data transfer agreements. Um, and these are negotiated when researchers receive or send um, non-human subject data or completely de-identified human subject data. Um, when identifiable human subject data is being shared, uh, consent must have been obtained um, from the data subject uh, as, as would have mentioned. Um, so DTAs uh, identify the parameters which govern the collection, transmission, storage, security, analysis, reuse, archiving, and importantly, destruction of data. So our data transfer agreements all cover these, these kinds of aspects. And these parameters are required to be in line with relevant data privacy, um, data privacy laws. So, for example, um, in our case, of course, PAPIA and, and more and more relevant is, is the GDPR. Um, so, for example, to comply with these, gathering, personally identifying and highly restricted health information should be subject to increased scrutiny and safeguards. And these are some of the considerations that we will, um, that we will take when um, reviewing a data transfer agreement that we receive or when we prepare an agreement to, to be sent to someone that we will be, um, that we will be sending data to. Um, the second kind of agreement that's becoming more and more relevant are data processing agreements. 
Um, so Jarrell also touched on these definitions, but just to put these into context for, for the agreement I want to discuss, um, a responsible party is uh, a public or private body, um, which um, alone or in conjunction with others determines the purpose um, and means for the processing. Um, often we get uh, data processing agreements from uh, colleagues in the EU, and then they will refer rather to a controller um, in the in terms of the legislation and then um, an operator um, is the person then who processes the personal information um, shared by by the responsible party um, and again in terms of the GDPR they are referred to as as processes so when a responsible party then um, elects to outsource the processing of the data um, it then transfers to an operator and then a data processing agreement must be entered into must be entered into two. So data processing agreements, um, they are essentially a commitment by the operators to, um, to stand to certain privacy and security requirements when they are, per when they are processing the personal data. Um, the specific requirements that, that stand out for me, um, the responsible party will require sufficient guarantees for the protection of the data transferred to the operators. And of course, this is because if there is a data breach, there may be consequences for the responsible party as they remain um, ultimately responsible for that data since they collected it from, from the data subject. Um, and then also the scope of processing to be defined and um, processing of the data must be restricted to that scope. So it's important that, um, that, that really it's defined what you are going to do with the data because this again has consequences for the responsible party as the data subject must provide consent for any intended um, processing. Um, then the second regulation that I just want to touch on um, with reference to agreements is um, external funder requirements. So this is particularly re relevant for me because I assist with um, due diligence processes um, that we are receiving from funders. So we have to we have to comply with uh, requirements from funders, but we we assist researchers and they essentially remain um, ultimately responsible for the obligations um, outlined in the research contract since they are actually doing um, or working with the data. Um, also. Um, if, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought over there for a second. Um, principal investigators on research projects, um, like I mentioned, they remain responsible, um, but we will go through the certain due diligence forms and the, the contracts with you to, to assist and make sure that you understand what, what is required of you. Um, so then just to give you a brief sort of overview of what we've been seeing over the past few months in terms of these requirements, um, the technical and organizational requirements for when Stellenbosch is handling identifiable data have become increasingly more onerous. And at this stage, we are tackling them on a case by case basis until we have more standard response um, that we can provide. Um, even then, though, our responses may need to be tailored depending on the questions from a funder or um, relevant responsible party. Uh, Hilda and her team have been so uh, indispensable in assisting us um, to navigate through these types of questions or the documents, and um, we are now becoming a, a lot better equipped to respond uh, to these kinds of requests. Um, this process is uh, as part of the SU Research IC toolkit, ICT Toolkit that, um, that she mentioned. So these are just a few of the requirements that we will assist and talk you through um, if the funder asks about our capabilities in this regard. So various security controls we have in place and our data processing, storage mediums, facilities and capabilities relevant to your researchers, which all of my colleagues have discussed throughout this, this workshop so far. So far. Um, we've recently been um, faced with these kinds of checklists or assessments from uh, organizations such as the Wellcome Trust, um, Tiger Brands and, and MediClinic, um, just to mention a few. They all sort of touch on very similar um, requirements, um, but some are just more extensive than others. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, we deal with them on a case by case basis um, at this point, um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them a lot faster because they're coming in um, thick and fast at the moment. 
Um, but thank you. That's that's it from my side in terms of really the due diligence and the, the contracts processes um, that we are facing with regards to research data management. Thank you. Thank you, Nasima. I'll give over to Professor Harald Tromp, and after that, we'll listen to Albert Skriver. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm just getting my slides ready. One moment. Okay. Didn't want to share. Let's do it again. There we go. And I can see it. Sticking it in. All right. Perfect. There we go. <coughs> So thank you for this uh, opportunity and to introduce myself just quickly. I've, I'm a bioinformatician and FMHS. I have been working with computers for 35 years. I've been administering Linux and Unix systems for about as long and have been doing uh, re research data management ad hoc without all the training. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is some concepts of big data because the work that I do is a lot of genomics and transcriptomics and things like that. And then uh, data integrity, security, storage, storage solution, management, and fair compliance in the concepts of how we apply it. Okay, so uh, big data originally was defined as highly unstructured um, data, of, so poorly structured, but lots of it. Scientific big data and uh, nowadays uh, is actually highly structured and there's lots of it. And I'll give you an RNA sequencing example. So typically the problem of data volume here is that per specimen we often do something like 50 million reads, maybe more. Each read length, uh, there's different instruments they can generate read lengths of 50, 75, 100, 125, and 150 are common for the parallel ones, most often 100 bases. Each base is um, accompanied by a quality indicator, which is in a quality string the same length as the read length. And then you have an ID string, and that together gives you about 250 characters per read. So with 250 characters and 50 million reads, you get about 17 to 35 gigabytes per specimen and double that if you're doing what is called paired end sequencing. So our problem is uh, one of uh, data management in terms of volumes of data that are not common in other uh, scenarios. So in data integrity, we also have the problem with uh, of where is it and is it the same? So has it been corrupted in storage? So that's those are big problems. So for organization, we actually have to define naming schemes that allow us to define efficiently where, uh, what we expect from a name. And um, in fact, I will later describe a scheme where we're trying to dissociate that from that, but in the interim, naming schemes are important. Uh, storage solutions and locations, is, uh, is, there's are currently lots of arrays per server, and then you of course have USB drives and sticks. We often get our data from vendors on USB drives, and then there's internal drives and computers, and none of this is ideal, but and we're trying to set up a more ideal storage for long-term storage. Um, th is it the same? We can do that with what are called digests. There's SHA um, digests and, and MD5 digests. They create a long, hexadecimal character string that tells you what the bytes are in a um, file. And if so much as one bit of that file is changed, it will change the digest sum. Now there are some what are called hash clashes where you get the same digest even though a bit has been flipped. Those are unusual, rare, but they do happen. So uh, what are we going to do about reliable storage? Um, there's write once, read many, or a redundancy. And then of course there's the longevity of data and with this volume of data that we deal with that is of course a problem. And then if you have redundancy, there's the resolution of corruption. If you have a bit flip in one file 
how do you decide which one got bit flipped? And that's where the digests come back into play as well. <clears throat> and here is a perfect example of how not to name files. Um, this was my personal irritation yesterday with having to fill out my timesheet, and you can see this ordered uh, uh, array of files start with the month in, in character, and uh, obviously that's out of order, so you have to hunt and peck to find files. It's just an example of how not to do it. Okay. Um, better uh, scheme of uh, file naming is to do what is called big Indian. Take your largest concept first and then string together uh, constructs of going to smaller and smaller. So depending on what's important for that type of file, you would either put the year first or the um, the type of file first and then the date in ISO 8601 format and so on. So that makes it much easier to work with the data and especially if you also then use separators between concepts that are not spaces or other things, but underscores or dashes um, gives you machinable file names that are easy to use. All right, so protection of information is very important. And uh, just to give you an, uh, a hint, uh, I worked for six years in a research uh, arm of a hospital system in the US, and so I am uh, exceedingly uh, sensitive to protection of information because uh, um, separating um, privacy containing data and non-privacy containing data was paramount in my job at that um, institution. Usually identifiable data are a small volume and they are trivial by research standards, so it is quite easy to set up separate um, uh, storage systems for them. Uh, we've already heard about a lot of protection standards, but other ones that you may not be familiar with, uh, that is uh, the FIPS, which is the financial um, one from the US, and HIPAA, which is another one from the US, which is sort of equivalent to our POPIA. Um, so for that, uh, we need to make sure that data, such data are protected in a, by technological schemes, and we use encryption within the database so that the data are uh, unencrypted when a person with privileges, um, the appropriate privileges, uh, tries to look at the data. They'll see the data. Other people will just see encrypted strings. And then also encrypted at rest so that if a disk uh, is obtained by somebody that they will not be able to uh, decode the data. Lastly, there's the concept of a data broker. Um, in large projects, we need uh, people who have access to the privacy data, who can look up information. This was particularly important in medical records uh, to get medical records for um, research data. One needs a data bro broker who can examine the medical records with ethics permission, of course, extract the appropriate uh, research data component and then de-identify it and hand it over to a researcher. <clears throat> so that is uh, has to be a person who is not doing analysis on the research project itself and is completely separate. Further protection of information is separation of data, no commingling of data. Um, identifiable data should be on a small data source, access controlled, encrypted, and this includes what we call the crosswalk tables, the, the link between privacy containing information and the de-identified data set. And the remainder of the data is de-identified, should be de-identified, and, and uh, within that identification string, that string should be completely um, unrelated to anything with the person. So obviously one needs something to identify the specimen, but that identifier should be completely unrelated to any uh, privacy data. Our uh, de-identified data, as I said, is our largest volume data. So protection in that sense for the privacy content of the data is not a big problem, it's manageable but the volume and integrity are the biggest problem. And then we typically use transmission not through the common tools. We use uh, a transmission that's encrypted 
in transit. My favorite is rsync over SSH. rsync allows you to resume transmission of large files. We do that even for de-identified data so that nothing is uh, transmitted in the clear. Um, so our storage solution that we're working on, this is together with IT, is uh, which something we call ResCom DAT. I can't remember what the COM stands for right now, but Research uh, Common Data Storage, I think is what it what came from. So this is going to be a data store for large data sets. Uh, we are using the Ceph uh, infrastructures, and I'll explain about that in a little bit more, but it's open source and it uses commodity hardware with multiple layer data storage, metadata management and provision. Um, it, these um, data stores are clusters, they, but one can federate between clusters. And uh, Elifu is also using the Ceph uh, infrastructure for their data storage. Um, it uses a novel the storage management system, which is quite different from prior uh, management systems, and this uh, involves assigning the place for storage uh, using a hashing scheme, and that is computed uh, on the fly so that uh, with the same name and um, information, um, one will be able to recompute the storage location, and so you don't have to do the lots of messaging that is goes on in normal data stores. Um, it also has this, its own file system, the Ceph file system, and the most important part for us is it's highly scalable. It can scale beyond exabytes, uh, which is 10 to the 18 bytes. Okay, <clears throat> so um, our cluster uh, Example. So on the right, you can see the sort of outline. The storage cluster is this um, collection of servers. Each one runs uh, an OS with uh, Ceph hardware, a uh, software on top of that, and uh, the commodity hardware is CPUs, memory disks, network. Uh, we currently have six uh, object data stores, OSDs. And those are uh, Dell R740XD2, which is the large data store format. We have three monitor servers and three management servers. And there's, of course, communication. So the monitor monitors to management is 10 gigabits per second. And the co connection to the actual data stores is 100 gigabits per second. Um, and so that's what we're going to be using for our um, data store. And right now, my slide is not going forward. There we go. All right. Uh, so uh, the system then has, uh, if you can see this, there's the manage monitoring systems and management systems. You have clients. They can uh, 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 insert data into the data pool pool will make requests. The hash is computed and it's automatically stored. It's restored in a redundant format. It's a way of doing it so that it is a lot like RAID, but the RAID here is not within one store, but across stores. And so even if you lose an entire uh, storage server, the, you will be able to recover the data. And with many servers, you can actually lose several and still recover the data. Um, and then there's a metadata pool that's uh, information about the, the data, um, and that uh, includes uh, digests and things like that. So that um, that's important. So then we get to management, how we're going to deal with this. So uh, we are going to probably have millions of files with eventually exabyte volumes. So this is going to be a problem. So we intend to put an IROTS layer on top of that. Uh, it's an integrated rule-oriented data system. Uh, it has rules about access duration, and it, you can even include rules that require uh, that ethics um, information be uh, obtained, uh, and that it, you can even require that before the data are uh, deposited so that you can ensure 
that you have uh, institutional compliance. So here on the right, you see a scheme of the data cycle. Initially, you have uh, private data as collection. Uh, later, you can get to sharing this uh, local policies, which include things like the ethics. There can be distribution policies uh, included. Uh, once you have uh, in this model, this would be then uh, analysis. And later, published data can be um, uh, regulated by the rules as well. And then eventually you can decide what uh, the lifespan of the data. Certain types of data can be destroyed. Other data have to be preserved for as long as um, they are useful. Uh, metadata would include who, what, where, and when, including an abstraction of names of files so that you can have um, the ability to recover files without uh, um, doing the naming schemes that, that people find so onerous. As I said, there's SHA and MD5 digest sums that also get computed. And this all in, uh, assists with fair compliance because it can enforce uh, ontology annotation and ethics approvals. And then we're also working on an implementation of uh, ISA, which stands for Investigation Study Assay. It's more of a meta-ontology than an ontology itself. It requires ontology references. So in this scheme here, you can see Investigation Study and Assay, their uh, data objects. And uh, in typical of ontologies, they have has contract, has contact with the person, information has publication, has other things, there's lots of other information in it. Uh, and uh, an investigation has a study, and, and each study has multiple assays. There can be multiple studies in an investigation. But in, in this, you can also see there are many places here where there are ontology references, which then restrict the vocabulary that can be used. Um, so you use your descriptions become ontology restricted vocabularies and by uh, instituting this we will be able to collect a fair annotation before during and after a study or assay it enforces the discipline of collecting that information and it enables effective data dictionaries this is something that uh, people don't do very well a data dictionary is an um, um, almost obligatory component of a study before you really collect the data so that you can adequately um, describe it and share it. Now the studies that I work on are very large uh, collaborative studies, so this becomes uh, increasingly important. And so that was it from me. I will stop sharing and thank you. It's Albert now. <laughs> Thank you. Albert? Thank you. I'm just getting my screen share ready. Okay. It's nearly there. It's, yes, I can see it. Something working. It's just. Yes. Yes. You can continue. Thank you, Albert. Thank you so much. So just maybe by way of introducing myself, um, I'm not a researcher, so I'm a bit out of context maybe in this session, but uh, I think after every content rich, every news bulletin, you need a little bit of a lighter input. So I hope I can provide that a little bit and also give a perspective on the agri-faculty, agricultural faculties, uh, work that I do there. So I'm coordinating the innovation and informatics platform at the faculty. And I know that a lot of things I will say here today is not as simple as I make it maybe, but I want to share some perspectives on some of the colleagues I talked to on the informatics uh, side, but also touching on to data science and how we then tackle um, this uh, RDM, these RDM issues. So um, some of it is maybe heard in the corridors or with my own interaction. And I would like to start with an analogy of the carrot versus the stick. No pun intended because of the agri background, but sometimes I talk to people and it's about regulation. We know we slept with another policy and 
you have to really work with uh, with uh, people to say that there's a real benefit in this. Um, and I think uh, if it's carrot versus stick, it's always a question of how much assistance do you get to really get to the to the carrot also to to make it uh, also for you possible to adhere to the regulations, but also to get benefit out of managing research data. And I think what we could see today, and all my colleagues here at the university have really displayed that well, is the measure of assistance that we really have uh, at the university. And I, I can also corroborate that because I also work with Innovus and with uh, the DRD on other projects, on innovation projects, and we really have world-class assistance. What I do get from colleagues sometimes is how do you actually leverage that assistance? How do you get access to it in a way that um, turns that stick into into a carrot. So, so I'll touch on some of those perspectives. Um, I think one of the sticks that that people see is is not only the regulations and the fact that we have Popia and all the things we have to adhere to. It's also the time impact of these um, of the of the data management plan of the start of a project to really kick off uh, eventually the project. So there is a time impact not only on the principal investigator, but there's also a time impact with regards to students involved and other people in the project. So I think one needs to plan for that very well. And from my perspective, I think our support system, this, these regulations have been quite young in our faculty and in our university indeed. So we do need to also from the faculty side, uh, look at our departments and the support systems that's in place also that's subject specific. And I'll, I'll touch on that a bit. Um, because it's not only about having the general uh, support, it's also about having uh, subjects specific support in agriculture as well. So moving from that perspective, maybe also the perspective of um, reward versus effort. We know that these things take effort and sometimes to get the reward, you do need to go further. But I think there's a there's a balance here. Uh, there's an intersection if you were to make a graph between you know, effort and benefit for, for all these um, uh, these actions that we need to perform in a research project, there will be a sweet spot somewhere where they perhaps intersect, where you have maximum also benefit without such an amount of effort that really compromises your, your project time management, etc. So I think as in life, it's important to get that sweet spot. And some perspectives I had in the beginning with this research data management from many people were that it's just impossible to balance that to, to the effort I have to put in versus the time. How am I going to uh, really execute this? But as you get into it, and I think some of my colleagues are here that really got into it at the start, I think it gets easier and you also create that support system for your colleagues. So apart from uh, that we also need to adhere to, uh, you know, our, our funders and in agriculture we have many of the funders are turning from fundamental research funding towards a very applied um, funding regime where the funder really wants outcomes from our research data as well. And I think that also poses a particular challenge because also to get funding and I'm working with uh, the funders like Wyantech. Uh, and some of the, the agri-industry funders and they be, be, begin to more and more ask for the research, uh, you know, data management plans, to see where data will be stored and how the industry could actually benefit from the data we collect and the, the outcomes that we uh, get from that data. I'll get to that in, in two slides from now. But maybe another point is we sometimes think that these things could be a one size, uh, size fits all scenario. And I, I work a little bit out of the faculty as well with other faculties, but uh, engineering specifically, we work quite a bit with. And I think it's important that this regulations and the application of the research data management uh, in the departments and in the researcher domains are not a one size fits all. One have to uh, be a bit, a bit discerning on what you uh, need to do when and how it pertains to your specific funder, to your specific project. Um, and I think there's a dual responsibility here. It's not a question of that we need, uh, you know, all the people speaking today to adhere and to help us to adhere to our specific needs. But it's important that we have that dual responsibility to ourselves, build maybe an agri 
um, you know, context on, on, on these plans and these support systems. And that's something I have been uh, envisaging to do for, for quite a while. So we need to actually customize our initiatives in, in cases per project where projects are very specific. As an example, in some uh, projects, we don't work really with personal information. So the POPIA requirements, maybe you work with, with farmer data and then there's still POPIA requirements, but it's not the same as working with a patient in the case of medical research. So we do need some discernment there on what we do apply and with uh, how much security we, we need to do that. And that we also have the support and the help from the colleagues uh, that spoke today. But we also need to add that context um, specifically to our specific industries. So uh, that would also help if we if we contextualize and and maybe fit the size better for each industry. We we will also have some joy in adhering to it because it will also be easier uh, in the end to execute projects. And when a master's degree or a PhD thesis have been written, you could really see not seamlessly, but with effort or less effort. Um, transfer the, the knowledge and the wisdom that we created from, from the data uh, to the industry. And this is where I want to link up to what we want to do with data. And I think our objectives is really to go from data to the information, knowledge and the wisdom that we can unlock. Specifically in agriculture, I think this is a very uh, important point. Uh, if you look at our funding and, and what the funders require from us, they really want us not to only work with data and information, but also to help them unlock knowledge. And to do that, um, you can you can only do that if you if you do the initial steps correct. And I think this is where uh, the advantage of excellent data curation and data management come in: is that these next steps, if you move from information to knowledge and further on, it just gets so much easier. To execute if you have good data management uh, procedures in place. So if we also look at what we're working with in the informatics sphere, uh, it's not all just about data management for the sake of analysis and uh, producing uh, publications and papers and thesis. We also increasingly have to look at this data ecosystem and I just use a McKinsey example here of the closed and, and strategic and open systems. And as a an university and specifically as an agri faculty, we, we sort of become, if we want it or not, part of a bigger ecosystem. In our case, a very complex value chain that is linked to every industry that we serve. And we do need to then see how we actually fit into that context, not only with our research and with what we want as outcomes, we also need to see how we fit with our data into an ecosystem of a, a bigger data domain. And, and this will also help us to have better relationships with our industry funders and also to make sure that um, these three ecosystems can healthily work together for specific uh, outcomes. So this is also, I think, a very important point to consider these not only the university context or the research project context of our data, but also to look a bit wider. And this is what informatics is all about. It's about looking at the potential outcomes of our data in a specific application or industry or even company or, or spin out uh, if you look towards the, the innovation side. So we have collaborations in the faculty and I just give an example of a Minnesota collaboration I've been involved in. And the uptake of this platform we've, we've created along with IT, a platform uh, that's already running in the U US, but at this stage we have an implementation on a virtual machine at the university, uh, this GEMS platform. It stands for Genetics, Environment, Management and Socioeconomics, um, Data-Driven Agricultural Innovation. So the idea here is that we collaborate um, along with our American partners, but also locally with industries on the data we, we curate and produce. So it's not only an university initiative, it is also a platform where we look to share data that's uh, particular to an industry with that industry in an, in an open and closed system. If it is required to be closed, you can also um, uh, put in security uh, to, to make it um, as such. Uh, the uptake has been quite limited so far, and some of my colleagues here that have tested it and worked with it will know that we had a first version that was quite buggy, 
and full of issues. And uh, in the COVID time last year, it was upgraded. So we now have the new new version of this and um, it's much better, but there are still some, you know, front end and user interaction platforms. And the other part of this that's very important is, and this is the carrot and not the stick, is that we need also to put more South African and African context data sets on this platform for it to be attractive for researchers to also collaborate on the platform. At the moment, we have still a very limited uh, open data set on it. And the idea is really that you can find lots of GIS and other uh, data sets as a background that can help you actually work on your data. And this is for me an example of how we can actually put the carrot in front of researchers when we curate data and work with data is also to offer open data systems. And we've seen a few of those examples also in the medical world. If you have an open system that works well and that you can share data with, um, it also helps with that relationship, but also to add value and to put data there that is in the public domain that can also assist the researcher to put context to their own data. For instance, this GEMS has metadata formats for different uh, genetics and, and other resources in agriculture, so it already helps, but it needs to be expanded also for our own uh, use. So ending off the last two slides, um, you've heard about the fair, or fair data pr uh, principles and properties, and this was one of the reasons the American counterparts created GEMS, is to be able to adhere to these standards in an agricultural context. And as you know, it's now extended also to ethical and revisability of the data. Um, and I think this is, is quite relevant for all of us to, to, to know what the fair principles entail and to be able to adhere to it. Um, and then lastly, maybe just on our faculty context, I work on the innovation platform, as I've mentioned, but also started to populate a, a subsection of our own agri um, website, which is an, like a knowledge base. And I've started to put the elements of the research data management outline, not to duplicate everything that is already on the wonderful research, resources we have at the library and elsewhere, but to really put an agri context to that information and to make sure that it is indeed uh, at the hand of the of the different researchers and also to be able to collaborate and add articles and things that's in our uh, uh, context specifically also on the informatic side of things with our industries etc so i think um, i've seen a comment in the chat earlier today at the beginning somebody said this is all overwhelming and i i, I took note of that word but what's positive in our faculty and some of of those people are here. We've got these centers of excellence almost um, uh, transpiring through all this difficult uh, procedures of managing research data. You get these centers of excellence people that really take uh, lots of effort to also help their colleagues uh, in this process, which can be very daunting and difficult and overwhelming indeed for some. And this is the support structures that we also need to create in our faculties and, and not only at the university uh, level. So I think this, uh, some of them are here today. We also collaborate with the data school, the School of Data Science and Computational Thinking in, in specific disciplines in agriculture. And this is also very positive because, uh, I mean, those people work with data every day of their lives, uh, more towards the data science uh, actual uh, goals and bioinformatics, but also I think the informatics must not stay behind and, and stay close to the industry application and problem solving um, abilities of the data we create. So that overwhelming, we need to turn that uh, almost a feeling of depression, if you think about all the things you have to do, into a feeling of excitement in what you can achieve with your data at the university, but also with your partners out there. So I thank you for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to uh, rich discussions going forward. Thank you very much, Albert and Gerard Tromp and all the other speakers. We really appreciate your time and effort. See, there's quite a number of questions in the chat box, and I will try to focus on those first that have not yet had a response. Um, Clarissa asked, if researchers want to use any other tools or software not mentioned in the toolkit slide, do they contact the Research ICT Service Desk for such approval or checking? And considering that these tools mentioned in the toolkit meet the minimum technical safeguards. And I think this is a question for Yulda and Samuel.
Hilda? Um, Cornelia, uh, I responded it's a little bit further down in the thread, but I can maybe just expand on, on that. Yes. Um, oh, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. A good example is, is Qualtrics, for example, that the Faculty of um, Management Sciences use quite heavily. So what we usually ask is the group who wants to use a non-institutional tool just to give us an indication of whether none of the institutional tools can meet their requirements. And in this case, they, they motivated that there's analysis functionality built into the application that none of our tools have. And also with a specific tool comes a, a population of potential participants um, that is within the, the target group for the, for the subject area. And that's also something not one of our institutional tools can deliver. So we said, yes, we we agree that this it will be valuable to have this tool in our toolkit. And at the moment, our security officer is investigating the security controls that Qualtrics has in place to make an informed decision. The other big determining factor will be the kind of data that will be stored or processed by the tool. So if it's something like personal health information, for example, the oversight will have to be very robust to give the go-ahead to use a non-institutional tool. But it's quite a, a complex process um, to provide that kind of oversight. And we reach out to the other research data management specialists outside of IT as well. But we're definitely not going to give a hard no and say you may only use institutional tools when we know that there's highly specialized requirements um, for which our existing tools are not fit for purpose. Thank you very much. Um, I saw that there was quite a lot of questions about um, data security, which was also answered. And then um, I'm not sure if this one is answered yet, but there was a question from uh, Ehlers. Is a spreadsheet or word processor sufficient for creating data dictionaries? If not, which tools do you recommend using, especially to benefit from the pros of, of um, an active data dictionary. This was directed to Professor Harald Tromp. Right, so I, I have briefly answered, but I can answer some more. Uh, personally, I prefer not to use a spreadsheet. Um, spreadsheets are wonderful tools, but um, they're very volatile. One can easily make mistakes and misalign columns or rows, and there are such things as uh, auto mutation of, of data elements. If you write anything that looks like an American date, like it starts with a SEP and has a number and it actually is something that you want, it's going to convert it to a date automatically and you can't do anything about it. <clears throat> Unless you then go back and make it a specifically a text cell and then enter the data. So spreadsheets have their own problem, but you know, as an interim solution, I do use them and um, uh, maybe I can find a data dictionary example quickly that uh, so I will show that um, when um, I'll look it up in the, in the moment and then I'll be able to show it in a moment uh, what a data dictionary should look like more or less. So uh, we can answer some other questions and I will look up my data dictionary example. Okay, there was a question from Engelbracht. Uh, Ms. Engelbracht and I think Marie Rue has answered, I'm not sure um, if that answer was relating to that. If we have gathered information about users of our laboratories by form apps, such as Google Forms or Match Forms, how do we go about to change from the current form to SU approved forms and remove sensitive information from these platforms? We started using these before the PR Act. Um, I'm not sure if um, Marie uh, attempted to answer that, but maybe 
anyone like to roll or Samuel or anyone else who would like to give an answer here can assist. Cornelia, uh, Geralia, yes. I, I think I'll, I'll start. Uh, so I think uh, it's a, a good opportunity to to look at the form as as a whole, not just about the platform itself. Uh, to give a, a glib example for, uh, let's say you're filling in a form that asks for your South African ID number, and the very next question asks for your date of birth, and the next question asks for your, your age. And all of that can be extracted from a South African ID number. So it may be an opportunity to find those, those elements and, and rework your form so it's more usable, it's more likely to be filled in and completed. Uh, you can also build those elements which which would help generate trust with whoever's forming the fill in the form in. Uh, for example, if I see somebody ask for an ID number and and a date of birth in the same form, it it raises my suspicions. They don't they don't know about the value of the information they're working with, etc. Uh, I I may choose to falsify the form as a result. Uh, that's my personal approach to to security. It's to pollute my data forms part of my my approach. So there's all these opportunities to look relook at the form as well, and and we have some guidance notes on our website that may that points out these elements. So I think start there, uh, um, and then then look at the the platforms thereafter, and then decide how we're going to handle our our data migration. Um, if if we're going to something leaner. Maybe there are elements of our old data that we can actually get rid of, you know, uh, reduce the value of that old data. We can delete certain fields, et cetera, and trim it down from there. Uh, but that that's from the, the Papier point, the, the technical aspects. Maybe one of our other colleagues could jump in. Um, Cornelia, if I can just add on to what um, Gerald stated, particularly for part one about uh, changing the forms, um, I think one thing that could be done is also the com the completion of the um, privacy self um, sorry the piece of privacy impact self assessment tool. If that could actually be um, completed just so we can see at least um, how risky um, are the resource data actually um, that are going to be collected in this sense um, because um, the it's been mentioned specifically that we're dealing with forms. Um, I think that um, something like um, REDCap would be a, an appropriate tool to use in this case. Um, you can actually complete forms um, making use um, of a tool such as um, REDCap. Um, you can either create, um, you can recreate the form from scratch or depending on the file format that you're actually using, you can actually import um, the form into um, REDCap so that you don't have to um, redo the entire process of, uh, of capturing the data. I've just forgotten the specific file format that's actually used, but there's a specific file format that allows you to import the data. Um, I won't go as far as to answering the second um, part, though. I just wanted to address um, the first part of the question. Thanks, Cornelia. It's maybe not giving an answer, but I think one of the important things we have to keep in mind is that if we use non-institutional tools or platforms like Google Docs, for example, um, we really have no control over the institutional data. Somebody spoke about the destruction of data. We don't know if you close your account with Google, for example, what really happens to that data. So even if you move away from the platform, does it mean that they destruct data in the true sense of the word? Because just because it's deleted, we can't access it anymore, doesn't mean it's not floating around somewhere. Um, and the one thing I do want to mention as well then is it might sound that if we say rather store it in Microsoft OneDrive, that it's the same thing. But there's a distinction um, that's not always clear. When we say the institutional instance of Microsoft 365, it means it is, I want to call it a private cloud. So it is the part of, of Microsoft um, 365 that through our institutional agreement with Microsoft, 
we get to configure and the, we have control over the data in that Microsoft environment. So when you go to portal.office.com, for example, which is how you access it online, if you have a personal Microsoft account, you'll see that you get an option to choose the account that was created by your IT division or your personal account. And there it is very important if you are working with institutional data to always select the account that was created by your IT division. And that means you use the Stellenbosch University Microsoft tenant and not the personal Microsoft space that any person can sign up for. I think we need to, to communicate this distinction between the university's Microsoft, if I can call it that, and the Microsoft that's accessible to anybody without paying for it, um, because that's really key to, to our research data management in many cases. Thanks. Thank you, Hilda. Professor Trump? Yes, uh, our one comment about the REDCap. REDCap has an API and um, application programming interface. One can actually upload data uh, programmatically. So once you've created your uh, research instance and created the form, you would have to figure out what the variable name in that form is, and then you can upload the data programmatically. <clears throat> I'm going to now share that um example of the data dictionary so uh, this data dictionary comes from a red cap instance you can see here's a red cap type and this is the variable name in the red cap instance and you can see red cap uses what is called a snake um snake case which is a Concepts separated by underscores, no capitals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> and uh, the variable label is a more human-readable form, and the variable group here is just uh, what form it comes from. In red cap type is a radio, but then the SQL type, that is the actual database type, would be considered a boolean. And some types are enumerated. Uh, boolean is one, but there are other ones where you have a sort of a list of options, which would be a lookup type, or in uh, in MySQL, an enum type. And then this data dictionary is then uh, augmented with, this is what really makes it a data dictionary. And this is a concept unique identifier. This comes from the National Library of Medicine, the NCI thesaurus. And this concept unique identifier is, for instance, diabetes mellitus. Uh, given this concept unique identifier, so this is a, a ontology tag, this will be interpretable in any language because this definition is a specific definition and there are different levels of it. In some cases, this um, you will have uh, a uh, concept unique identifier that says this is going to be ICD-10. So here we might, uh, because we don't have it beforehand, we can't define it precisely. Uh, we would say, okay, we're going to augment this with an ICD-10 code, which would then explain what it is. Um, other places we have tobacco use, tobacco user, yes, no, maybe. So that enumeration also has its own concept unique identifier. Um, there are temporal concepts where, so you have fever as a main concept, but you also have temporal concepts which are uh, listed as their own concept unique identifiers here. We don't have a specific um, concept unique identifier, but we do say we're going to translate it from an ontology called Rx norm, which is um, the, the, the prescription normalization uh, ontology and so on and so forth. And as you can see, this particular ontology uh, data dictionary has some 800, there's a few missing, uh, 774 um, 
uh, elements of which about 200 are in this particular list, which is the list that will be shared with our uh, collaborators at other sites. And that was it for a data dictionary example. Um, I would take questions on it if anybody wants to ask more questions on it. Specific questions to Professor Trump. I see something about the red cap data for processing in Python. Um, yes, one uh, one a an instance you need a a key. It's so, sort of like a SSH um, key value pair. So you need a public key for a particular instance in red cap. So your the REDCap administrator would allow you to have access to the API and give you a key. That key is de also dependent on your login. So you would have to have login privileges with REDCap and then the key, and that key would then be uh, uh, a programmatic access that gives you the the um, the, the the, the privileges, so it encodes your privileges, so it can restrict you to a particular instance or a particular set of columns in the instance or whatever. So it, it does allow you to have very secure access. Thank you. Um, I see there was some responses to Professor Antonio Estreisen's question, but I would just like to add from my side that I would suggest that you have a standard terms and conditions from your group when you, whenever you do work for researchers or for students, which then clearly state that you will keep the data and the associated reports for a period of, say, for instance, 12 months. And after that, you will destroy it, and that it's the researchers' responsibility to keep the records, and that they are welcome to refer any queries to you within that 12-month period. Um, I think that will protect your group to not be not feel responsible, because there is definitely a limitation on until when you should take responsibility for the data. I think if you give them a clear indication of when you will destroy the data, they have no other choice but to make sure that they protect their own data. That would be my recommendation to you. If you need um, us to help you with uh, terms and conditions of some sorts, then, then you can contact our office. Um, Gerald, there were quite a lot of information and questions shared on the topic of, um, I'm not sure if it's data security, but it's around all of, of you. During your presentation, there was quite a number of questions and answers. I'm not sure if you would perhaps like to take some of those and um, give a small overview between you and Professor Gerard Tromp and to make sure that all the queries was answered pro properly. Sure. Uh, most of them seem to stem from uh, people posting about the I have been pwned service and there was some discussion on passwords. Um, uh, Password management systems, for example, were also discussed. I think our discussion in the chat was, was sufficient, but there is a bit of nerd jargon in there. Uh, we talked about zero day vulnerabilities, for example. Um, Yes, please elaborate on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and, and maybe this will be the last nerd jargon for, for the day. So a, a zero day is basically um, the, the users and the creators of the tool in question with this vulnerability have had zero days in which to respond to it since its discovery. I, I think that's a, a, I think Prof. Trump put a, a nice uh, summary in the chat of, or nice definition in the chat as well of it. Um, so it's, that's probably beyond the, the context of what, what our participants need to know today, but for, for IT, for example, they need to have at least uh, an awareness and knowledge that zero day vulnerabilities can exist and they do exist, and we need to have some sort of plan to handle them when we become aware of them. Uh, so who who do we who do we call during that week between Christmas and New Year to come in and, and put in the new patch that addresses this vulnerability, for example? 
Uh, but but for most of our colleagues on the call today, I, I hope you don't have to deal with this and it's handled invisibly by our great team in IT. Prof. Yeah. Tom? For people who are into this, there is something called CSERT. It's the American Computer Security, and I forget what the rest stands for. Uh, you can actually register there for notices on your particular software. So even though it may be zero day, they they put out a notice on um, any vulnerabilities right away and you you know so that you at least get as notification as soon as possible um, I have subscribed to that for a long time I haven't currently done it um, because I do run a very secure ship <laughs> um, so <clears throat> so that that's one way of getting information it's sort of like an information broker for for that. Um, yeah, so I think security is something one one in this job one has to be um, something like paranoid, but you're not paranoid because they really are out to get you. Uh, so I, you know, um, I also administered the send mail inst um, uh, instance for, for many years. Um, yeah like 15 years and was never compromised once because I always was ahead of the game in terms of securing it and, and instituting um, security. So it was never used for spamming or anything like that. I was there later in, the, in that period, I was the only individual in the university who was allowed to run his own send mail instance because they didn't have to worry about security. <laughs> like I said, you have to be, you have to be paranoid. Thank you for sharing that. I'm not sure. I can't see any further new questions popping up. If there's anyone else who'd like to ask a question, this is now your opportunity. Samuel. I actually just wanted to make a comment rather. Um, there was a question that was asked by Clarissa about um, the um, storage of sensitive passive research um, data, and I did respond to that. Um, at the moment, um, and I see Hilda did add something um, to my response. At the moment, there isn't um, an ideal storage solution for sensitive passive research data. And by, by passive research data, I'm referring to research data that exists after the research process has come to an end. Most of what um, we discussed today, um, the tools related to the active phase. Sun Scholar data is there for passive research data. However, it's primarily used for non-sensitive research data. So that, that then creates a bit of a problem in terms of the sensitive research data that exists at the university, because essentially that research data is technically homeless, except for the data that can wind up on REDCap. Um, so there's a solution that still needs to be brought online at, at the university in order to address this. And this is uh, it's a bit of a risk from a data security and privacy perspective if the research data do contain any um, personal identifiers. Um, so I just want to point that out that although I did state that passive um, sensitive data can go in Microsoft Teams, Hilda states that it's not ideal for um, passive research data. It's probably more ideal for the active phase. Uh, I don't know if Hilda, you'd like to add anything to what I just stated or if anyone else wanted to state something. Uh, yes, Samuel, I can confirm that Microsoft Teams should not be used to archive passive data. It's only for the use for um, active data. When somebody leaves the university, for example, and they're the only custodian of that team site, the site essentially becomes a, a orphan. Um, and then it becomes a case of garbage in, garbage out. So nobody can find that data in any case. So it's definitely not fit for purpose to house passive research data. The other thing that is also worth mentioning, and it's to my mind, it's a bit of an elephant in the room, is that there's also not at the moment um, funding forthcoming for even our um, platform for Sun Scholar data that will house the data that can go into the public domain. Um, so 
that's really, to my mind, uh, a, a big risk as well, because my assumption is that we won't be able to continue using the platform unless um, institutional funding is made available. Uh, and I think the research data management task team will speak to that risk very strongly, but at, at the moment there, there is no funding for forthcoming for, for our pa passive data repository. Yes, and we have raised that as a as a risk, a risk. several times already. Um, Professor Trump. Yes, I just want to add that I think most um, studies do not start out with the knowledge or, or awareness that they need to budget in storage for their data. And I think this is a mistake and I think uh, we need to work with the um, research management to ensure that budget, uh, budgets for studies or for applications contain adequate funding for storage over a period of say 10 years. It's a very important point that so hopefully with some awareness creation we will get to that point, but we are definitely not there yet. I would like to actually make a suggestion that there be like a checkbox that has to be checked before a grant can go in. Um, because if that's not done, we probably won't get there. Um, but anyway, that's just my suggestion. The other thing that there was question about uh, passive storage of um, privacy containing data, I always recommend that people um, uh, co compress it into an archive and secure it with a, a, a strong password key that then that gets stored somewhere known to the um, people who use it, especially if those data are not going to be used frequently. That helps you prevent uh, accidental data privacy leakage because uh, should that file become somehow available, if you have, say, a 30 character key that, that, that unlocks it, it is un unlikely that anybody will be able to compromise the data. Oh, good point. Um, Samuel, I think you had your hand up, yes? Um, yes, I just wanted to make a comment about the storage cost um, aspect. Um, so with regards to the data management planning um, solution we're looking at, um, it does actually have a cost calculator that's kind of built into it, but you can add it almost like a module for people to look at. But this is different from the institutional IT's um, cost calculator. So by extension, you could then add IT's um, cost calculator to the module. Now for anyone who's going through um, ethical clearance applications, um, this is something that could be screened. But since not everyone actually applies for ethical clearance, it's a bit of an issue because the, t the tool has the ability to make this available. But the question is, how do you get everyone to actually use the tool so that as if they select to um, answer the questions prior to submitting their data management plan along with their grant application, they will be prompted to um, complete the stores or at least to calculate their stores costs. And this is something that the RDM regulations stipulate that researchers should consider their stores costs um, at the commencement of their research um, projects. But um, in terms of, um, I wouldn't want to call it compliance, but let's just say um, in terms of people actually doing that, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different story, but the tools are available to sort of facilitate that. Yes, thank you for that. Um, is there any last question to any of the presenters? Just a last comment. Um, yes. I think uh, the storage cost for large data sets is a little different from the smaller data sets, so we might need a separate uh, calculator. Hilda, you want to comment on that? I can maybe just clarify that the IT cost calculator is for storage on um, our virtual machines. So it's not for um, 
the the longer term storage of of passive data. Thank you. I see Miss Engelbrecht has her hand up. It should be open for you to speak. Um, let me just see if I can. Thank you, Jessica became active. Um, I was filling out the red cap for um, uh, registration just now, and I see that it says that if I want people outside of our institution to complete the form, then I it might be violating some sort of um, policy or, or agreement. Um, is red cap really um, limited only for Stellenbosch University? Then if I create a form, can only Stellenbosch University people um, complete the form, or is there an option for outside people? We have users from all over, other from other research institutions, and so on and so on. Hilda, are you the person that will answer that? I can attempt to answer that. So, RedCap projects in RedCap may only be created by SU person, so somebody with the SU username and password. Um, the survey can be shared with anybody. At the moment, research collaborators from outside the university um, requires SU credentials if they want to participate in the in the data management. So not answering the survey, for example. But we also realize that it's very pricey to get a SU username and password for an external person. So very recently. REDCap implemented functionality called the allow list that we are now investigating. And what we are hoping it will do at least is that if the collaborator is with another higher education institution, for starters, probably in South Africa, um, that they can, we can set it up through um, our authentication mechanism so that they can log in with their own institutional credentials at at another university and as long as their name is then on the allow list um, and it will be added via the admin team if the principal investigator asks us then it sounds like a viable workaround for that very pricey username and password issue we are experiencing. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any new questions. One last chance. Any more questions from anyone? Any further comments from any of the presenters? None. I think we had a very successful in Daba. Um, I've certainly learned a lot and I trust you have also. Um, it's always interesting to learn about such a topic that has so many dimensions on it. So um, thank you very much for your time and especially to the presenters for making their time available and sharing the expertise and knowledge. We really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Bye bye.